No? Okay. All right. So again, I'm Tim Wallace. Uh, I work at Descartes Labs, um, where we are, uh, what our company line is we are building a digital twin of the planet. Essentially, we have a platform where we ingest all of the Earth observation data we possibly can, and we build models on it to predict what's next. Uh, but my role there is a little bit more creative. Um, I get to play around with data and uh, make visualizations with some of the work that we're doing and also do some experimentation on work we might do in the future. So I'm Tim Wallace, and that, uh, the second guy there, Krishna Kara, he didn't come, and he's also wisely uninternetable. He's like not on Twitter or anything like that, but I promise he exists. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. Um, and also because he's not here, I'm not going to get into the technical stuff because I, uh, I can't imagine what, <laughs> what he would say if I got it all wrong. Um, so we can save that for later. Okay, so the, the title of this talk is The Look of Earth, and I have to apologize to Arthur Robinson for uh, stealing this uh, type of title, The Look of Maps, of course, is a book that famously uh, did not include any maps. Um, so after, uh, after submitting the uh, abstract, I was like, you know what, actually, it's more like looking at maps, which is like what I do just all the time. So this is another book uh, by William Wonders. Uh, that I found on archive.org, looking at maps. So this is more like looking at Earth. And I look at Earth a lot. Um, in fact, um, <laughs> one night recently when my, my son was going to bed, he walked by and he was like, hey, Daddy, what are you doing? Looking at Earth? Uh, I'm not making that up. He's <laughs> like, yeah. And I, in fact, was looking at Earth. I was probably looking at something like this, uh, which is Strathcona Provincial Park in uh, Victoria, British Columbia or possibly something like this, uh, an image of the eye of Hurricane Harvey, or maybe something like this, a nighttime lights image showing a snow path after a storm outside of Chicago. Or now that I live in New Mexico, maybe I was looking at this uh, image of um, some, uh, a recent snowfall um, on some canyons in, in New Mexico. It's possible I was looking at this, uh, Kilauea at night on Landsat 8, um, most of the night images are just useful for thermal bands, but uh, if you have some hot, bright lava, you can see it in the visible bands as well. Um, or maybe I was looking at this, another hurricane, Hurricane Jose, uh, which this is a Sentinel-2 image, and if you uh, put the bands in sequence, you can kind of make a little pretend animation there showing the cloud movement. Or perhaps I was looking at this, uh, Chicago during the polar vortex, or more recently, uh, looking at this, um, um, fall foliage in upstate New York. Um, all of these are images that just show what's going on at a given time. Uh, but at Descartes Labs, we also look at things as they happen uh, over the course of many years. Um, and one way we did this recently was by, uh, we, we did a piece with uh, Washington Post, we did some work for the Washington Post on fall foliage, and this, this looks like it's sort of like natural progression of colors uh, during the fall. Um, but it was pretty complicated to make because autumn is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very foggy time, it's a cloudy, cloudy time, so satellites don't capture images all the time, so we had to use quite a lot of imagery. So the platform at Descartes Labs helps us do that. So that's New Hampshire. This is the UP in Michigan. So we're looking at Earth in snapshots, but we're also compressing large amounts of data to figure out larger trends. And some of the things we look at, and I won't get into this too much, but some of the things we look at are things you actually can't even see. This is a composite of methane emissions um, over the course of many months. Um, and it's, it's a complicated thing to, uh, to detect and also measure, um, but we're, we're doing some, some early work with that. And so I look at these things and I think what's what, what, you know, what, what part's important, what's not. Um, and I think back to this legacy of abstracting Earth that all the cartographers before us have partaken in. Here's a book from uh, 1874, I think it's called The Draftsman. This is like a map of nowhere that has everything in it. Um, 
it's an example of how you should abstract various things. The book also includes some very specific examples of how you should or could um, map islands, docks, mills, the sea, and color and in black and white. This one I like, natural divisions of earth, as if there's an unnatural division of earth. Um, I guess that's, that's what last night's talk was about. Um, so you have capes and islands, peninsulas, mountains. This is, this is the way we map these things. Several years later, in the early 1900s, here's how you map cleared lands, cultivated lands, evergreen trees, fresh marsh, salt marsh, ledges. Here's another example, just showing you how to do a more like sort of militaristic looking map. I love this example, a uh, method for, of delineating mountains. I like that the image is just, you're supposed to get it. It's like the, it's sort of like drawing an owl meme, right? Here's a method, drawing mountains like this now. Here's a lake with some beautiful contours and shaded relief and some hills. And these were all in books showing you as a surveyor, as a cartographer, how you, how you should be doing these things. Uh, different types of trees and how you would abstract them. And going back all the way to the 1700s, here's this book showing you how you can map different uh, physical features as well. And um, think, uh, also the sort of uh, farms and uh, orchards and so forth. I like this one. I tweeted about this last week, trying to figure out if anyone could guess what the double water lines one is, because it's... Uh, I don't, it still doesn't really make much sense to me. But it was a proposal for mapping high and low water lines, so the high and low tide. So all of these things existed because uh, not everyone maps the same way, not everyone sort of understands what they're looking at the same way. Uh, and this, this is a map uh, that my son made yesterday, apparently, because uh, my wife told him that I was at a mapping conference, and he's like, I can make maps. <laughs> so this is his map of... This is, this is what, how he described it. This is a map entitled Candy Island, Rainbow Island, Clean Island, Outer Space, and New York City. <laughs> so it's kind of great, right? But it's hard to understand unless you talk to the person who made that map. It's a bit abstract. So then there's this idea of an ideal map. Like, what's the map that like, everyone understands? And here's this illustration that I love, uh, where it's like, you know, don't worry about the map. The map should be like this thing that you can just like, see straight through to the actual physical landscape. Um, it's not possible, but it, it, it's, a good <laughs> it's a good illustration, I think. Uh, and it's a good thing to strive for, I suppose, in a certain way. Um, so at Descartes Labs, we're, we're sort of in our early stages, and you'll see just how early, of doing something we're calling generative geographies. And so I have some examples, uh, very simple things that many of you could do on your computer with Photoshop that I would have no other way to describe than calling them absurd. One is uh, this content-aware fill of all of the water features in New York City. And you see it turns into this... Uh, this urban hellscape. <laughs> I feel like it's okay for me to say that since I lived there for several years. Um, and here, here are some close-ups um, showing, you know, the East River filling up. I like, I like the duplication of Stytown there. It's pretty good. Just fill in that river with some buildings. This is, a, a tr I don't know what's called, Trump Links or something um, in Queens. And it just, like, it's, like, sprawls into the water. And in New Jersey, um, all the marshland fills up with uh, some green. There are a couple buildings pop in there too. And then there's also this idea of uh, using this content to wear scale, which is, <laughs> I can't get enough of this. <laughs> Should we just watch this for the next 10 minutes? <laughs> um, so in Photoshop, there is, there's a tool called Content-Aware Scale, and if you use it on maps, you can get some pretty good results. I think you know what I mean by good. Uh, all, right, so then, all right, so we're actually trying to do something maybe useful, maybe beautiful with generative geographies at Descartes Labs. Um, and, and, and the way that we're doing it, at least initially, is to tr we're trying to abstract things to principal components like they did in you know, the old days with maps. Like, this is what a dock looks like. This is what a mountain looks like. 
Um, and, and the inspiration for that was this New York Times piece from, uh, I believe it was 20, 2018, that um, went, it, it went into sort of like the, the idea of a GAN, this is generative adversarial uh, networks. Basically, I'm not, again, Chris is not here, so I'm not gonna try, I'm gonna try not to misspeak, but it's basically like two algorithms that are like bickering back and forth about what's right and what's wrong, and when the one, you know, one of them's like, ha I gotcha, and then he like sort of logs what's right and what's wrong, and it keeps going until it gets something believable, like sort of the last several images here, which are not of an actual human, they are uh, computer generated. In order to do that, you need a vast amounts of data, and if you're a geographer, you might know of OpenStreetMap. So here's, here's a map of um, the distribution of the tennis tag, ten sport equals tennis. Uh, that map was of uh, Europe, this is the whole, um, the whole world. Uh, tag info is a great spot, uh, a great little tool for seeing distribution of tags. Um, here are some of those examples in the US in NAEP imagery. And so one of the things we tried was uh, city park. So this is an example of a city park. We used tag info. We grabbed thousands, tens of thousands of, of city parks. And it didn't turn out so great. Um, what does that look like? Goodness sakes. Should I just, should I just end the talk now? <laughs> it gets a little bit better, don't worry. So that's city parks. That didn't work so well. I'm wondering, though, if anyone can guess the geography we're trying to reproduce here. Let's so other islands. That's all right. Thank goodness you got that. Can anyone guess what part of the, I'll say it's in the US. Can anyone guess what part of the country? And this isn't like a Tacoma trick question. <laughs> all right, I'll just tell you. Um, those are, uh, there was a very small uh, geographic data set. It was islands in New England. so. Um, Mount Desert Island in Maine, uh, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island. And so that's what that was trying to do, was trying to recreate New England islands. We also tried using MODIS data to recreate tropical islands with uh, varying levels of success. This is actually the first thing we did and, and, and the first one we were sort of excited to, to try a little harder on. Um, what does this look like? So anyone want to guess what that looks like? And if it is something or isn't something? Nothing. All right, having lived in New York for a few years, this to me just looked like, uh, I don't know, Upper West Side or something, Morningside Heights. Um, but this is something Krishna made, uh, creating or training again, just on nape imagery within the island of Manhattan, nothing on the shoreline. So it's just trying to look, recreate the urban landscape. Here's another example. Another example. And when you look at the source imagery, you can kind of see it gets some things right. Certainly gets the street grid angle right. We're, we haven't checked yet, but we're, we're pretty sure it's, it's kind of like forcing a percentage of um, tree canopy that is probably also right if you are looking at the whole island at once. So this is the model training. You can see it kind of getting better as it plugs along. And these are sort of our best, best examples. All right, now to the thing that I am most excited about. We're calling it Fatim Mundi. I don't know if anyone here knows a ton of Latin, but that was my stab at weird earth, because um, it is pretty weird. Uh, we took the Discover Epic uh, satellite. We took uh, full disk images from that, about 3,000 randomly chosen images, and created uh, some fake weird earths. Um, this is, uh, this is what the raw data looks like when you get it. Every time I look at this GIF, I hear the uh, like yakety sax song in my head. <laughs> um, I'll do that for the next five minutes. Um, but when it's processed, it's a little bit more smooth and you can see things like, I don't know if the projector, proje yeah, yeah. So you can see things like, because it's always on, you can see things like um, eclipses. And you can also, because of the weird uh, location, it's at the Lagrange point where it's like constantly on the sunlit side of the Earth. You can create 
strange animations like this or like this. This is like what one of my colleague uh, Dylan Rich called this the perfect compromise between flat earth and not flat earth. Uh, so this is Krishna's, uh, these are Krishna's results. This is, uh, this is not the model training. This is an animation showing the, the principal components, the, the most common, the most important elements of Earth uh, being layered on um, sequentially. So it starts with water, and then, then you see, start to see clouds. Um, throughout, you see the sun glint because, um, because the satellite is always in the same place. You're always going to have that sun glint. Um, and the result, the, the final, you know, by the end, it, it really does look quite a lot like Earth. It's almost kind of like the perfect training data. A, a lot better than um, <laughs> whatever that first one was I showed you, the city parks, goodness sakes. All right, so here's the quiz. Which one is fake? Oh, my, the, the, uh, the projector is helping me, I think. <laughs> Left is fake. Wrong. No, actually, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> the left one is fake. But if you only glanced at it for a second, it's, it's reasonably believable, I think. Right, here they are. And here are, here's just like six that I thought looked particularly compelling. Um, and I'm going to end with why bother? Right? Why are we doing this? Um, and I actually chatted with Krishna this morning and all of the reasons I was telling him why we're bothering, he's like, that's not actually true. That's not true. So I, <laughs> so I told him, all right, I'll just end with why bother, and that's it, and walk off, off away from the podium. Uh, but I, we did come to a, uh, to, to a compromise. Um, there is more to it than art, artistic experimentation and wackiness off the rails, although that is kind of how I live my life. I like the wackiness off the rails. Um, the, the, the main thing that the applied scientists at Descartes Labs like this technique for is creating more training data. So you know that something exists, you're not sure exactly where it is. You use the, the, the known examples of that thing. It could, could be tennis courts. We know where those are, but we, it could be tennis courts. You train a model to generate more tennis courts, and then you can use that to help find the other ones. And of course, you'll be validating it and so on. Um, but that is, that is the main reason uh, many of us applied scientists say that we do this. But also there are possibly more practical and meaningful impacts here. Um, this is the campfire last year on, uh, GOES, on the GOES satellite. And we're building a wildfire detector using data from that satellite that uh, detects and could possibly alert local officials to a potential for fire, fire within uh, 10 minutes of ignition, which is a pretty big deal, but it's quite a lot faster than, you know, in the past where uh, observations were every 12 hours or so. Um, and one of the elements of it, this is not implemented yet, but one of the elements is using this GAN technique to predict what the next image is. So a machine learning algorithm will look at these recent images in order to predict what the next one is, and if the prediction is compared to the, the real observation and there's a hot anomaly, there's a likelihood that there's a fire. So there are practical applications. Um, and the, the um, SANS GAN technique for that is, is currently live on the uh, LA Times wildfire map. Um, so you can check out our data feed there. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. <laughs>